Welcome back to the Brew Bowl. It's time for our round one wrap up. So we'll go across to the uh, sheet and then we'll look at how the Darius teams are looking after the first round of gameplay. So first off, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about how the leaderboard has been done here. So uh, if you didn't follow the Brew Bowl last time, you get three points for a win, one point for a draw, zero points for a loss. Uh, and the tiebreaker is the points difference. So number of uh, touchdowns scored for versus touchdown, number of touchdowns scored against. So obviously in the first round, there's going to be quite a few uh, equal places here. So in a clear uh, first edition is the Slum City Blight, which is the Nemesis team. Uh, he was the only person to go three up in his game against the Glamoff Gladi uh, sorry, Guardians. Uh, then we have two equal second positions. So the Quaddles and the Drakes. Uh, so that's uh, Pondo's Lizard Man team and an NPC Wood Elf team, who's also the returning champions. They came in with a plus two uh, positive position against the uh, against uh, with a win still. Then we have three teams in equal fourth. So the Corn team of the Scrabble Butchers, the Goblin team of the Fungus Bay Fanatics, and Spoon's Dwarf team, the Idol Hammerers, all on three points, but with only a plus one differential. Uh, then we go to the teams that uh, got draws in this first round. So the Ice One PKLs, the Norse team. Uh, then we have Lawson's Chaos Renegades, the Kids of Outcasts. The Taylor Beckland Griffins, our Nobility team. And finally, AP Skaven team, the Warps and Enslavers, all see an equal seventh place on one league point with a plus zero differential. Uh, and then we have three teams uh, with a minus one from a loss, which is the Lykeberg Knights, which is Mike's vampire team. The Pantry Raiders, which is the Halfling team. And then we've also got Omar Krieg's Norska Marauders, which is Chaos Chosen. Uh, then two and 14th, equal 14th place, the Hagenet Executioners, which is the Dark Elf team. And Asklon Gladiators, which is Fohammer's Amazon team, both on the minus two differential. And at the very bottom in 16th position is the Glamoff Guardians, who were beaten 3-0, of course, by the Sun City Blight, the Old Wild Alliance team. So that is our position after first round. Let's go look at how, how the teams themselves are actually doing. So first off, we've got the Ascalon Gladiators. This is the Amazon team from uh, Fohammer. Uh, he did have a Blitzer die during the game. Uh, obviously quite an expensive loss. Uh, he did get one of his blockers to level up with Wrestle, uh, but that means he will be going in with only seven players in the next game uh, and only three positionals. Um, but overall, the team is still relatively okay. You just need some more money to go back and replace that that Blitzer before you can go and invest in other things like an Apothecary. Uh, Pondo's team, the Axotl, sorry, Axtotl Coatles, the Lizardman team, a uh, very good game for him. He did take one of his um, linemen, his Skinks, uh, took a miss next game. So he'll be going into next game with a Skink Journeyman. Not such an issue because he has no rerolls unless he somehow manages to get an extra reroll. Uh, and one of his skinks did pick up Fend as well. So his team will feel much the same in the next game as it did in the last game, just with an extra Fend skill. Then we have the Goblin team, the Fungus Bay Fanatics. Uh, so they did quite well with a 2-0 victory, or sorry, 2-1 victory, I should say, sorry, over the over the Knights. Uh, so here we got one of the uh, Goblin linemen picked up defensive. Not really a very good skill for a Goblin, but that's what you get random skills sometimes. And we had enough money there to buy a bomber too. So they've now got a bench of two, although two of their players are secret weapon players, which means that they will be knocked off the team. I, I probably wouldn't even put one on at a time. Uh, and then there is that extra player to make sure that always seven players can take the field, unless there are injuries and other removals as well. Climb off Guardians, our last place team, um, didn't have a great game going down 3-0 against the Blight. Uh, one of their players, their Blitzer, did pick up Pile Driver. You know, an average skill. Uh, they saved their money though, so they're sitting at 605 team value to whoever they play in this uh, in the second round. The Dark Elf team had an absolutely shocking game uh, against the Lizardmen. So they took uh, one dead player, one of the linemen. They took the Witch Elf took a miss next game. Uh, so they'll be going in needing two journeymen because uh, they have only 30k, not, not nowhere near enough to buy another player. Um, so they're going to be running them with. Four regular linemen, a runner, two blitzers, and one of the blitzers picked up diving tackle. Uh, but yeah, certainly a way to get back for that team from where they're currently positioned. The Ice Horn PKRs also had a rough game with both the Valkyries being knocked out in the next game, including one of which picked up a new skill, Nerves of Steel. So they'll be going to the next game with five linemen and two Ulfunar. 
Uh, so yeah, a, a big drop off in their offensive potential, uh, but we'll see what they can do in, in the second round. Spoons team, the Idol Hammerers, uh, had a great win. Uh, they also had no major injuries, picked up a second play with kick. So they have got, he's got two options for kicking, one blitz and one lineman. Uh, and they have a very strong position at 750 team value. I think the second highest in the league at the moment. Lawson's team, the Kith of Outcasts, also had a bit of a rough game with one player killed, he's Skaven. Uh, and then also one of his players taking a, uh, a, a serious injury meaning that he will need to have at least one journeyman if he doesn't spend some of his money to buy in alignment. He has got enough money to do so, though. Uh, and then also his Minotaur picked up block, which is a great result for the Minotaur, although a risk now the Minotaur might leave in uh, in subsequent games, so we'll have to see how well that works out for Lawson in the long run. The Lykeberg Knights, our vampire team, which is Mike's team, also another rough game, two dead linemen, uh, one lineman did what well, one of those I should say was killed by one of Mike's own players, thanks to Animal Savagery. Uh, he did pick up Dodge on a lineman, and he has also replaced a lineman. Uh, he did have a poor role on his management role to recruit that new player, so that new player will have one game with Lone of Four Plus on them before the uh, before they get that skill removed or that trait removed. On to the Lauren Forest Drakes, uh, uh, returning champions, also. A rough game right at the end when one of their uh, war dancers, their, their star player war dancer, got pushed down a hole and died. Uh, their other their other war dancer did pick up a new skill, but it's going to take them a while before they can afford to replace that dead war dancer. Uh, I guess maybe maybe next game because they have a high fan factor, as does their opponent, being well, you'll see them will be the iron iron hold hammers. So they should hopefully get money to be able to replace that dead war dancer, but that's not accounting for any other dead players they might get in the in the second round. The Norsecum Marauders uh, had a rough game in terms of the overall score, but no loss of injuries. Uh, and one of the blockers did pick up claws. So I think that uh, uh, Omar Krieg's team is in a good position to do better in their second round match against the Gladiators. The Scravel Butchers, who beat the Marauders, uh, once again, no significant injuries here. Uh, we did get foul appearance on one of their Marauders, which, or the Lyman, which is going to be hard to remember, but hopefully that's something we remember to do in the future. Foul appearance is. One of those ones I always seem to forget, along with disturbing presence. But uh, hopefully we'll notice that and note that 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 particular player is harder to block, or there's a there's a one in six chance that blocks against him immediately fail. The Raiders, uh, of course, had one of their tree men die very first turn of the game. Ran up, did a push action, fell over, and died. Uh, so very expensive loss there. They should be able to get it back within two games, I'd say, to replace that dead tree man. Um, but overall, they will get they'll get they'll get no lineman or no journeyman this round because they have enough players. So they probably just need to have a a bad match they might lose, and hopefully get some money to buy that treatment back. Our league leaders, the Nemesis team, the Sum City Blight, um, no injuries. Uh, they have extra arms on one of their linemen as well, so giving him some uh, extra ability when it comes to throwing the ball. So, uh, yeah, a good overall result for the Namus, and the team's well set up for their second round match. Uh, the Griffins, who played in the first match against the Enslavers, um, didn't have a great match in terms of scoring, uh, but did manage to avoid having any long-term injuries and did pick up Leap on, their, um, on one of their blitzes. AP's team, the Warpstone Enslavers, once again, no injuries uh, with a victory. Uh, and uh, sorry, I should say they they was a draw. They, those two drew. Um, did pick up dirty player on one of their rats. I don't think that's what he was looking for, but he did also buy an apothecary, which puts the enslavers into the highest position for overall team value at eight fifty. So looking at the player leaderboard, um, what I've actually done is I've combined the results from this league with the last league. So if you want to see just the individual player results from this league only do go and check out the tool play site because that does show a an honors board for multiple different tracking things for both teams and players, specifically to this current season. But overall, what have we had here? We've had uh, the Griffins thrower, Oswald Clippell, is still well in front with seven total um, conversions, although Thilo Schultz, who has only had a single game this uh, entire competition, uh, being this first game this, this, uh, this season, did pick up four conversions in the one game putting him straight into equal second place on the passes board. Blackball Brady, also another new player for the Blight, 
managed to get three conversions in the game as well and uh, put himself in fourth position straight away. For the highest scorers, Mini did pick up one extra uh, score. Uh, the other one to note there is that Faziet, we one of the war dancers, is the one that died. So his score will never improve, and we'll probably see other players come through and push him down the bottom of the list or off the list, off the top five eventually. For most deadly players, um, Rain Lewis remains in front with the war dancer, the dead, now dead war dancer, sitting in equal place, equal first place there. Uh, other than that, I would note here that uh, Spoon has three of his players on the top casualty list as well. So good job to Spoon to, for taking players out. Uh, MVPs, really, this is a, a bit of a, a non-measure because you, you try to spread it around, but Rain Lewis and his scene there on three, none of which count for this season. Though, so therefore, he currently has no uh, risk of being drafted away, but uh, he is still a very strong player. And then for value, look, it's going to, always going to be the big guys at the front there with the Minotaur, Bloodspawn, Ogre, and two Rat Ogres. In fact, there's even a third Rat Ogre who's in equal third place as well, but I just did them in alphabetical order. So uh, if you look on tour play, tour play actually ranks the players when it comes to expense, it, the regular players, the big guys, and the stunty players. So let's talk about the second round. And one of the nice things that tour play does is it actually gives a a ranking score for each team in a number of areas. So offensive, defensive, um, brutality, resilience, and dirty play. So in talking about how these teams will do, we can look at or talk about the the numbers that tour players allocated them based upon their first round performance. So first off, we've got uh, the Hammers, who were last season's third place team against last season's winner, the Drakes. Uh, so this one, the it actually... Tour play gives more points to the Hammers. So they've got one for offense, four for defense, four for brutality, three for resilience, and two for dirty play, giving them a total team score of 14 versus the Drakes with two on offense, four on defense, one for brutality, four resilience, but zero dirty play, and a total of 11. So we'll see how those numbers actually translate into success on the field, but uh, just some extra things to consider. The Goblin team, the Fanatics taking on the Corn team, the Butchers. So in this case, uh, we're looking at a offense of two, defense of three, brutality of one, resilience of three, and dirty play of one for the Fanatics. Whereas the Butchers sit here at uh, one offense, four defense, two brutality, four resilience, and three dirty play. So 14 total for the Butchers, 10 total for the Fanatics. So it would seem to favor the Butchers there, especially with their ability to remove players they had in this uh, first round match as well. Uh, the Coatles versus the Blight. So Pondo's Coatles sitting at two for offense, four for defense, two for brutality, three for resilience, zero for dirty play or 11 total, uh, given that Pondo said he won't do fouls unless he gets fouled. Uh, the Blight are at three offense, four defense, two brutality, four resilience and one dirty play. So a total of 14 there. So three teams total on 14 being the Hammerers, the Butchers and the Blight. Uh, in the Enslavers Outcast match, we've got uh, one for offense on the Enslavers, three for defense, two for brutality, four for resilience, zero for dirty play, or 10 total. And the Outcasts are at one for offense, three for defense, one brutality, three resilience, one dirty play for nine total. Moving over to the uh, the back half of the round, and of course the game don't necessarily be in this particular order, but it's just to go through how, how I've scheduled them. Uh, okay, so the Jarl sitting at one offense, three defense, one brutality, three resilience, one dirty play, or nine in total, going up against the Griffins, who got one offense, three defense, zero brutality, two resilience, and one dirty play for a total of seven. Uh, then we've got uh, Fiamma's team, the Gladiators, taking on uh, Omar Krieg's team, the Marauders. So the Gladiators got zero offense, two defense, zero brutality, three resilience, zero dirty play, total of five. Marauders are at zero offense, three defense, zero brutality, two resilience, one dirty play, or six. So very close there. The Raiders Guardians game, the Halfling's got uh, zero offense, three defense, one brutality, zero resilience, one dirty play for five total. The Guardians actually only, well, they got zero offense, one defense, zero brutality, two resilience, zero dirty play for a three being the lowest overall uh, result in this particular measure. And final game, the Dark Elves and the Executioners, who've got zero offense, two defense, one brutality, two resilience, zero dirty play, or five. We're going up against the Vampire team, Mike's Knights. 
uh, who will be on one offense, two defense, one brutality, three resilience, two duty play, or a total of nine. So in actual fact, uh, the Knights have one of the highest scores, or have the highest score of all the teams which lost in the first round, and in fact are, are equal to the highest teams which drew in the first round. So uh, it shows that the Knights certainly have more they can do when they're not injuring their own players. Uh, so that is it for the summary of round one. I hope you, you've enjoyed the game so far, and there'll be more action coming up in round two in the next couple of weeks. Some exciting matches. Some will be NPC resolved, so I'm looking at new ways to show how the NPC resolved matches are done. Uh, but we'll also see uh, not one, not two, but three PC versus PC matches in this second round. So there'll be five games total will be fully televised on YouTube as before. Uh, and then there'll be three games will be NPC games that are resolved separately. Uh, so I hope you will join us and I will see you next time.